So do you all have a good week? Good week. Yes, Monday. And everybody sat every day? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Even got in a couple two-hour sittings. Well, good. Okay, are we ready to start? Okay. So, today I was going to do Sutta number 140, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, the exposition of the elements. Now, this is a long sutta. I'm probably not going to get through it, but there are some points in it that are very important that you understand. Thus, if I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering through the Magadahan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter Bhagawa and said to him, If it's not inconvenient for you, Bhagawa, I will stay one night in your workshop. It's not inconvenient for me, venerable sir. But there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now, there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. On that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. Then the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukusati and said to him, If it's not inconvenient for you, monk, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the Venerable One stay as long as he likes. Then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop, preparing a spread of grass at one end, and sat down, holding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukusati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, This clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the Venerable Pukusati, Under whom have you gone forth, monk? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect, that the blessed one, pages got stuck, is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. Now this particular, it's called a gatha, it's uh, the whole sutta is the good qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And one of the advantages of saying this, uh, the good qualities of the Buddha, is that it overcomes fear. If you have any fear arising in your mind, then you start. Uh, 
reciting the good qualities of the Buddha, and the fear will go away. Now, I had one student that she came to me and she said she can't really meditate because she's afraid to close her eyes. So I had her saying this before she sat. And after she sat, I had her repeating it. Now, this is Sutta number 140, uh, section number six, in case you're looking for it. I did this particular sutta uh, there's uh you know the the mala beads that you, that you can use they're counting beads there's a hundred and eight of them and when you do it correctly, it comes out exactly right. If you make a mistake, then you got to start all over again until you can get it correct. Now, I did nine times a day, nine repetitions of this sutta. And generally speaking, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to go through that. But I went through nine rounds, nine times, in about 10 minutes because I became so familiar with it. I could just go right through it. My, my collected mind was very, very sharp. So this helps your mind settle down when you think of the good qualities of the Buddha. And I, I, uh, if, if you have the time to go through it and learn it, I recommend that you do it in Pali. The way they do it in Sri Lanka is they just go nine times around. Uh, if you do it the Burmese style, then you do it forwards and backwards nine times. And that's the way I was doing it. And it does help you overcome any kind of uh, restlessness, fear, anxieties, any uh, sadness. It helps a lot with that when you think of the good qualities of the Buddha. So it can be an aid for you. If you run into problems with your meditation, you can do that for a little while and it will help. I have gone forth under the Blessed One. That Blessed One is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that Blessed One. Now, he'd never met the Buddha. He was a king of a minor uh, realm and gave up his kingdom and became a monk. Now he was going for the first time, he was gonna go look up the Buddha and study with him. But monk, where is the blessed one accomplished and fully awakened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Sawati. The blessed one accomplished and fully awakened is now living there. But monk, have you ever seen that blessed one? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I've never seen the blessed one before. Nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the blessed one thought, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati thus, Monk, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied. The Blessed One said this, 
Monk, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, 18 kinds of mental exploration. And he has four foundation. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands on these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom. These are the foundations right now. One should not neglect wisdom. That means understanding the, the links of dependent origination and how they work. Should preserve truth. Should cultivate relinquishment. This is actually meaning the six R's. Letting go of craving. And should train for peace. This is a summary of the exposition of the six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, and the space element, and the consciousness element. So it is with reference to this that it was said, monks, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact, so it was said. And with reference to what was this said, there are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, and the base of body contact. And the base of six uh, mind contact, excuse me. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this person consists of six bases of contact. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, on seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form with the eye productive of joy. One explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind. One explores one of these uh, sense doors productive of joy one explores these sense doors productive of grief one explores the sense doors productive of equanimity so it was with reference to this that it was said monk this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration Monk, this person has four foundations, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this person has four foundations. That's a little bit different than what most people think of as the four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, cultivate the six R's. Letting go of craving. This is real important. Of, uh, 
you can't say one one foundation is more important than the others. But the start of the relinquishment of craving is something that has to be done often. Every time your mind gets distracted, you use the six R's and come back, and you can see right behind me. We have release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. So it's real important that you understand that it's not a sometime practice. You find your mind wandering during the day, just thinking this and that. There's just nonsense thoughts. Use the six R's and come back to the smile. Smiling during your daily activities improves your mindfulness. Improves your ability to see clearly how mind's attention distracts itself. And you let that go and relax. Too many times we get involved with our thoughts. And it mostly has to do with, uh, it, it has to do with uh, emotional things which is your habitual tendency, getting caught with likes and dislikes. Right now, because of the election that's about to take place, an awful lot of people get very opinionated one way or the other, and they start arguing with each other. And then when the argument is done, you, they go away, and then they keep thinking about it. Now, one of the things that the Buddha said that's very important to remember, it is what you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. If you keep thinking about one, one person or the other and how you're going to vote and how everybody else is dumb because they don't see your point of view, you keep thinking about that, your mind is going to keep bringing it up. And that takes away from your happiness. You are causing your own pain by being over opinionated and thinking about it over and over and over again. An awful lot of people are suffering because of that right now. So don't add to that. Relax into that. Let it be. It's not that important. It, it's important in a mundane way, but it's not important for your happiness. It takes away your happiness. You've already made up your mind how you're gonna, what you're going to do, how you're going to vote, so you don't need to think about it anymore. You know what you're going to do. So why get caught up in talking with other people about it and, and getting caught up in likes and dislikes and then having those same thoughts come over again and again and again and cause yourself a lot of suffering. I just had some people visiting here and one of the persons was very much into her dislike, dissatisfaction, aversion, hatred because of one person or another that they had opinions about. And she caused herself immeasurable amounts of pain. So don't do that to yourself. You've already made up your mind, so you don't need to think about it again and again and again. That's restlessness. And then you throw a version on top of it. So what good is that? 
One of the things I told this couple that came is, I don't want you watching TV. I don't want you listening to the radio. I don't want you reading uh, newspapers. Because all that does is make your mind get more opinionated and you rethink thoughts over and over and over again. I had one lady that she read five newspapers every day outside of a waste of time because there's not much you really learn in the newspapers. Uh, the weather, you can learn a little bit from the uh, comics. And that's, uh, that's about it. So why do you need all this other stuff put into your mind so you think about it the rest of the day? You're causing yourself suffering. When I got her to stop reading the newspapers, all of a sudden she started smiling a lot more. When I first came back from Asia, uh, I, the first year or so, everybody that I was teaching, I said, I don't want you to read anything. I don't want you to read books. I don't want you to read the newspaper. I don't want you looking at the news. The only thing that's allowable for them is what I told them was listen to Dhamma talks that I had on tape and practice meditation. After a year, then I started giving them little booklets to read about the Dhamma. but submerge yourself in the Dhamma and you will be a lot happier. So, so it was said and with reference to what was this said, how monks, does one not neglect wisdom? There are these six elements the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. We'll get more into that in a little bit. What monk is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved and clung to. That is head hairs, body hairs, tails, knee, tails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines. Contents of the stomach and feces. Order whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Now, one of the things that you have to understand about dependent origination is, is that it's showing you that there is no self. Everything is an impersonal process. Anytime you get caught up in your opinions and ideas and uh, arguments and whatever, whose opinion, whose idea, whose argument is it? Oh, it's mine. And I'm right and they're wrong. But as you see here, there is no part in your body that's you. Now, I've gone to a few autopsies. 
and they start cutting it open and pulling out the different organs and weighing them and that sort of thing. Well, am I my heart? Am I my brain? Where am I? It's just a bunch of parts that are put together. It's no difference between your body and an automobile. Where is the automobile? Is it the, the, the windshield? Is it the steering wheel? Is it the motor? Where is it? It's a bunch of little parts put together and it's the same with your body. And we're going to go through more parts of your body. And you have to understand, when we start taking these things personally, we have opinions about them. And those opinions can be right or wrong. It doesn't matter, to be quite honest. When we take these things personally and try to control them, we are causing ourselves a lot of suffering. Now, if you have lust coming up in your mind, the way you overcome this is by looking at these different parts as if they're just separate in a, in a, a bowl. Where are you in any of these different things? I used to tell my college students, they're of the age where the hormones are pretty strong and they, they see a lot of beauty around and they get thinking about it. So they get distracted very easily. So I told them that any time they saw a beautiful person walk by, turn them inside out. Tell me which part of their body is really worth lusting after. Oh, you have a great set of intestines. Your liver is wonderful. What's beautiful about that? Your body hair or your head hair is, oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, you drop some of your head hair in soup and then you start eating the soup and tell me how beautiful the hair is. Or you leave it in a bowl for a little while and smell it. All the perfume that you've been putting on your hair disappears fairly quickly. And hair actually does not smell good. So why do you take it personally? It's up to you. But any time you spend an over amount of time with your thinking about the different body parts, uh, you'll start to get repulsed by it. You start to go, ah, oh, nah, that's, I don't want to be thinking about this. This puts your mind into balance. This particular kind of meditation is specifically for monks. So they don't have lust arising when they're dealing with on different people. So they keep equanimity in their mind. They don't get distracted. So, when one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element. Disenchantment is a higher degree of equanimity. Now, the more the stronger equanimity comes into your daily life, the more balance you have. 
the less likely you're ha- going to have in getting caught up in disagreements and arguments. It just won't happen so much. It's not that important. When you get into disenchantment, even things like your favorite foods, where you used to see it and your mouth would start watering like Pavlov's dog. Now when you have disenchantment, it's food. Yes, it's a food that I've enjoyed in the past. I like this food, but there's no attachment in it. There's no excitement, that emotional uh, hit of adrenaline doesn't happen so much. I have some students that uh, I call them adrenaline junkies because they get excited about all kinds of stuff. And then they get into their emotions and they start identifying with those emotions. And it's just a, a big round uh, circle of dukkha that you get caught up in. So the more you become disenchanted, the less excitement there is in your mind with that adrenaline taking off because I like this part. This is wonderful. This is great stuff. When you get to a certain place of disenchantment, your mind gets into dispassion. So even the slightest little craving that starts to come up doesn't cause excitement to arise in your mind. And a dispassionate mind is very, very close to a mind that experiences Nibbana. And what monk is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittles, not oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. That's called the internal water element. Now, tell me what's pleasurable about the smell of, oh, let's say pus or phlegm, or bile. A lot of these things that keep your body functioning really are not pleasant, but it's necessary. So you don't like to identify with that. That puts your mind in a state of balance instead of a state of lust or turn somebody inside out and say, oh, your pus is really gorgeous. <laughs> that gives you an idea of your body's made up of this stuff. What is desirable about it? Now, this is given to monks. It, this is this kind of meditation, at least the way the Burmese taught it, and that's how I learned it, is through the Burmese, takes 165 days of going over and visualizing bowls of these different body parts. Anytime I got to the liquid body parts, my mind just, oh, it, it repulsed. Don't like that at all. 
And eventually I, I de developed a very strong case of uh, disenchantment. Where are you in any of these different body parts? Are you there? That was a question that I looked at a lot while I was watching the autopsies because the body was being taken, taken apart. Where am I? Am I in the brain? No, the brain is just a big glob, to be quite honest. Am I there? Where is it? Where am I? When you start seeing it in this way, you start looking more and more closely at the impersonal nature of everything. Every part of your body. Of all of the characteristics, impermanence, suffering, and the impersonal nature, the impersonal nature is the hardest one to really apply to your daily activities. It's easy to see how things are changing all the time. But we have a very strong attachment because of craving. We have a very strong attachment to the other parts of our body. This is me, this is mine, this is who I am. And because of that, we get caught up more and more in the suffering. We cause ourselves immeasurable oceans and oceans of suffering. Do we do it on purpose? No. It happens by itself when the conditions are right for it to occur. But craving is such a big thing that it takes a lot of practice to be able, one, to recognize it as the I like it, I don't like it mind. That's the start of your false belief in a personal self. And to be able to see it as it actually is, it's only this. It's only that. It's not me. It's not mine. It's not who I am. In the Chachaka Sutta, it repeats that over and over and over again with all the different parts of links of dependent origination. It's really quite amazing. And if you listen very attentively to that sutta and see how it applies and don't get caught up just because it has a lot of, of repetition in it, don't get caught up in a like and dislike or, oh, I've heard that before. I have some students that have heard it maybe 50 times and they still get insights from it. That sutta is very, very powerful. And I highly recommend anybody that wants to do it to memorize that sutta. And you'd be surprised how you use that sutta with your daily activities to help put yourself in balance. Now, the thing with the water element, let your mind be like water. When water is going down a creek and it comes across a boulder or a log, what does it do? Does it try to push it out of the way so it can keep going in the way that it, they, the water wants it to be going? Or does it simply allow it to be and find a way to get around it without taking it personally, without fighting anything? That's why drops is so important. Don't resist or 
push. Soften your mind with everything and smile into it. When you use drops and you'll find that your mind starts to get into a state of equanimity that's very nice and you stop taking this kind of stuff so personally. That's another way of practicing six R's. Relax into it. Stop taking things personally. Stop involving yourself with the emotional, I like this, I don't like that. The Buddha comes across, uh, comes a, once every few hundred thousand or million years, it depends on si the situation. You don't realize how lucky you really are to be born so close to the time of a Buddha. We're still living in the Buddha era. It might not come around again for well, a few hundred thousand years, a million years, who knows? When conditions are right, another Buddha will appear. So how lucky can you be? You have this Dhamma, and it's in reasonably good shape, especially when you add your relaxed step in it. You use the six R's. Take advantage of this. Now, I get a lot of uh, comments about the Buddha didn't tell you to smile. Well, he told you to be happy. What is the expression of happiness? Smiling. And how much are they finding these days that a smile affects your mood? It affects the way you see the world around you. So the more that you can smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The easier it is to see when you get caught, the easier it is to let go of that attachment. Let your mind be like water. Don't resist or push anything out of the way. Don't suppress anything. Now, one of the definitions of an arahat in the Anguttara Nikaya is he is a person that doesn't have any secrets. Now, what does that mean, really? A person with no secrets. Well, I don't have any secrets, except when you broke a precept and you kept that personally, and it affects the way you see the world around you. You did something in the past, and you were embarrassed, or you were shocked at, at the behavior and you don't want anybody to know that you did something like that. When you let go of that secret, all of a sudden, everything becomes more clear, more alive. And when you let go of the secrets, it's easier to attain Nibbana. Ni means no, Bana means fire. So it's letting go of the fire. Uh, Buddha Dasa, he was a Thai monk that really affected all of Thailand. 
because he he went around teaching what the Buddha taught, and this, he, he did a lot of studying in the suttas and that sort of thing. And he presented the Dhamma in a way to the the monks who had been getting into magic, Thai magic. It's an undercurrent of Buddhism in in Thailand. And a lot of people, they, they put a lot of faith in their Thai magic to manifest things and do things like that. And it was during the, I, I, I guess uh, Buddha Dasa started teaching that around the 40s, 1940s, 45. And in the 50s and 60s. And he got people back on the path of real Buddhism. Buddhism has its ups and downs. During the time of uh, Buddha Gosa, who wrote the Visuddhimagga, during that time, the monks had gotten very lax. They didn't do any meditation. They didn't study. They just went around and did their, like the Thai, did their Thai magic. And uh, astrology, astronomy, not astronomy. Uh, astrology. Astrology, yeah, okay. But when he came around, he started saying, well, the Buddha said this, and he's, the Buddha said, you need to practice your generosity and you need to practice keeping your precepts. And it was like brand new ideas. Now, when you keep your precept, your mind starts to be like water. Your mind will settle down your mind will be very collected. You won't have a lot of distractions. And your meditation is going to be very good because you won't have the secret of whatever it is. Sometimes the secrets are not even breaking a precept. Sometimes it's just a secret that you said something or did something that it wasn't actually breaking a precept, but you feel in, embarrassed about it and you don't want to tell anybody about it. Secrets cause you to be hot because of the craving, because you're taking it personally. So make your mind like water. Don't hold on into anything. The second step of the six R's, the release step, is extremely important. An awful lot of people get involved in uh, whatever thought comes up, whatever memory comes up, and they get caught in thinking about it. Well, that means they have that secret. And they're caught by it, and it takes a while to purify that. The six R's are the purifying factor of the Eightfold Path. Sometimes it takes a long time to let go of some things. Now, we do a lot of teaching of forgiveness. And forgiveness is a very powerful tool of learning how to have a clear, uncluttered mind, uncluttered from past experiences, fast, uh, from past being embarrassed or being shy and not telling somebody, anybody else about what you've gone through. And that clouds the way you see the world around you. 
And when you let that go, when you let go of that attachment, that craving, it becomes much more clear and alert. Your mind becomes much more alert. So it's a make your mind like water. Water doesn't let anything obstruct it. It just keeps on running and, and finding new places to explore, as it were, but not being attached to anything, not trying to control anything. One of the biggest problems with craving is you're trying to hide something and not let it go. What are you trying to hide? Whatever it was that caused that craving to stay there. You took it personally. You, you did something or said something and you wish you hadn't done it. And then you just kind of I'll slough it off and think about something else for a little while. And then you forget about it. But then when you're coming up to the meditation and the six R's, why do you think you have such a busy mind? What's happening here? There is attachment in your mind. What is the attachment? It's a craving. It's a secret that you don't want to tell anybody else. Now, sometimes women will come to me and they'll be very embarrassed because they had an abortion. And they felt incredibly guilty. So I, I work with them with forgiveness. And before long, they can let go of that guilty feeling. And that just opens up huge amounts of space in your experience. So you see things more clearly. You're not looking through the embarrassment of a past experience. That's what forgiveness does. It's a mind that has acceptance in it. It's a mind that says, okay, that happened, fine. You don't have to feel guilty about it anymore. But the thing with secrets is you need to tell somebody else what your secret is. As soon as you tell them, it's not a secret anymore. And you're able to let go of that block that's stopping you from going deeper. Make your mind like water. And the way you do that is by letting go of secrets. Letting go of that embarrassment or that shyness or that guilty feeling. Whatever it is that causes that. So keep your mind like water. Let your mind flow around those things. If it starts to block, what happens if a rock gets in the way? Does the water start complaining about it? Or it just says, it hits, hits the rock and says, oop, can't go that way, got to go, not, go around. And the water will start looking for another way to go. Keep your mind loose like that. And your meditation will get very good very quickly. Now, this everything is interrelated with the things that I'm talking about. If you can let go and let your mind be like water, that means your mindfulness gets better. And the whole reason for your smiling, you start seeing, oh, that's why he wants me to do it all the time. Because it makes that difference. It makes a difference in the way you see the world. 
and the way you affect the world. So, I start you off with the meditation in an easy way. Smile. All the time, smile. Why? It improves your mindfulness. It improves your mindfulness, then you can see how an obstruction, how some kind of distraction causes your mind to get caught. And then there's a lot of suffering. So when you improve your mindfulness, you see that distraction quicker and you let your mind flow around it without getting caught up in it. And when you don't feed something, it gets weak and goes away. You feed your mind with, or you feed your distraction with your thoughts about it and getting caught up in it and feeling guilty and ashamed and whatever word you want to put on it. But when you keep your mind like water, you can see that it's there. You don't keep your attention on it. You relax. You sm smile. And bring that clear, light mind back to your object of meditation. And sometimes during your daily activities, your object of meditation is smiling. When you smile, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. Every time you use the six R's, you're practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. See how all of this stuff is interconnected. And I wish it would be taught more by the people that are teaching meditation. But there's a lot of, there's advantage to doing all kinds of meditation. It's not a right and wrong kind of thing. It's just what is the end result of your practice? Does it lead to your happiness and the happiness of others around you or not? Does it lead to being able to see hindrances and let them go or not? That's what meditation is. It's not just about sitting in one place at, at a time and allowing your mind to be quiet for a period of time. But when you come out of the meditation, does your mind have that same degree of quietness? Does your mind just start ho-humming around, thinking this and that and liking this and hating that? If you practice the six R's, a way that I keep stressing, you will have personality change. You will start to let go more and more of distractions and things that have caused you upset in the past. Letting go of the lust and the hatred and the restlessness and the doubts and the dullness of mind. Letting go of all of those things more and more clear your mind becomes different, uplifted. You become kinder, you become more gentle. Naturally, there's no, I'm supposed to be this way or I'm supposed to be that way. I had somebody 
got get in touch with me and she said, you had a student that was followed you for a lot of retreats and now she became a Christian. What are you going to do about that? I said, what should I do about it? That's her choice. Yeah, but she'd become a soda pana. So? Does that mean that excludes it from excludes every other religion because she became a soda pana? I don't care if you're a Jew. I don't care if you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter. It's the letting go of these attachments that cause us so much suffering and pain. And spending time on helping people to be happy. That's the job of the Buddhists. Help others be happy. Help others to lessen their suffering. Okay, I only got as far as the water and I see I've uh, gotten to my hour. I, I, I'm much more, uh, I take a lot more time to give Dhamma talks. And uh, it didn't used to be like that. It used to be that I would give a, a, a talk for, oh, about 45 minutes. And then I got invited to be at this one big monastery in Kuala Lumpur. And the head monk was K. Sri Dhammananda, and he gave two-hour Dhamma talks. Now, he asked me to come and be at that monastery because he was getting old, and every Friday he gave a two-hour Dhamma talk, and he said, I want you to give a Dhamma talk every other week. So I had to give a two-hour Dhamma talk every other week, and I got in the habit of doing that. And I came here after being in, in Asia for so long, and giving long Dhamma talks, I came here and everybody complained when it was more than 15 minutes. They had an attention span that was at, uh, two minutes at the most before they got distracted. And oh, the complaints I had. I said, well, if you really listen to what I'm saying, you'll see that I repeat myself a lot. So the, the, it can sink in. You don't have to memorize what I'm saying. You hear it enough and you start doing it naturally enough for yourself, then you're, you're teaching yourself. I'm not your teacher. You teach yourself at the rate that you need to under, understand things. You might take a lot longer to understand uh, some things and other things, all of a sudden, they just come to you. Now, these are insights, and they happen all the time. The idea of insight meditation is almost absurd. And this rigid, well, it's got to be, there are these 16 different insight knowledges that you have to attain before you can attain Nibbana. Actually, it was, what, it was 11, 12. And then after you had that experience, then you had more insight knowledges. But the reason I wanted to call this Meditation, when I first got back from Asia, I wanted to call it the Oh Wow Meditation because there are so many insights that you get. But I got talked out of it. Still, I might go back to it, I don't know. <laughs> got talked into to TWIM, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation which is okay, I guess, but oh wow, makes it, is, makes it sound more exciting. 
<laughs> so, do you have any questions? Um, you have to un unmute yourself if you have a question. Thank you, Bante, for uh, <clears throat> thank you for your talk, and it's nice to see you this week. Oh, thank you. I have a question. Um, the jhanas are also impersonal, like when the conditions are right, okay. they arise in our practice. Right. Does this mean that eventually we will we should also grow disenchanted with jhanas and like stop trying to have jhanic experiences? You're, it's not that you grow in, in disenchanted with the da, the jhana. The dana becomes more disenchanted. And what I mean by that is every level of jhana has equanimity in it. And it gets to be finer and finer as you go deeper and deeper. And then when you get into the deeper kinds of jhana practice and the arupa jhana practice, then that disenchantment just kind of takes over for the equanimity and your mind doesn't get so excited about things, and your mind stays more in balance with things. So it's just different degrees of equanimity that grow into disenchantment. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Susan? Hello, Bhante. Thank you for taking my question. Yes. Um, and I appreciate the duration of time that you give the Dharma. It's totally appreciated, the duration. So the question is, you mentioned we are lucky to be within the time of the Buddha. Yes, but we that's are. Like six, isn't that about 16th century away? Is this considered still close to the Buddha time? I ask this because some uh, a talk mentioned that people who are further away from the time of the Buddha is less I may misquote this less pure or less lucky or less pure than right. the people within the time of the Buddha well Thank you. see a Buddha era lasts this Buddha era lasts about 5,000 years we're about halfway through this Buddha era okay and the Dhamma will st start to be watered down and people won't be experiencing uh, Nibbana as much. And it will get to a period of time where it's even one rule for the monks is not, not remembered anymore. And that's the end of the Buddha era. The closer you can be reborn to uh, the time of the Buddha, the more you're actually uh, liable to have good experiences from your understanding and practices. Thank you. Uh -huh. I take away from what you just said, we are only halfway from the Buddha era? Right. We're in okay. The wow. We are lucky then. Thank you. Very lucky. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, thank you for your time. I've been uh, with your practice for about five years. I've emailed with David a lot. I've never actually spoken to him or you. Um, <laughs> he's a really good teacher because he says the same thing over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had a question about what I think is the eighth jhana. It's, it's, a, it's a place that I get to frequently in my meditation. It's, it's, it's similar to it in that it's a, a dreamlike state. It's consistent. It doesn't come and go. It's always there. I've had lots of phenomenon as I've developed that, you know, you're feeling smaller, larger, shrinking, dissolved, whatever. They all go away after a few sittings. But this one's always there. And I would really describe it as sort of a trance state. Um, but I'm aware of the whole time I'm in it. And the descriptions of the eighth jhana that say you're not aware of it when you're in it sort of have me make me wonder if what I'm experiencing is actually that or something else, if that makes sense. Well, you know, you're talking about the eighth jhana as neither perception or non-perception, right? Yes, sir. 
Okay. Do you have thoughts at that time? Sometimes. You're not in the jhana at that time. Okay. The quiet mind doesn't have any distractions or disturbances. You know you're in that jhana because your mindfulness is very good. Now, if you get to a place where there is nothing, I mean, you don't even know your, you don't know in anything at all. You don't know you're in this state until you come out of it. This is called the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. So you don't know you're in it till you come out. When you come out, you have different things that can occur. And that that is the beginning of having uh, a, a uh, Nibbanic experience. Mm -hmm. Is there a name for this sort of trance-like place? Or is that just something that maybe I'm just experiencing? It's not a trance. If, it, if you're in a trance, you know you're in a trance. I have a feeling that you've been doing a lot of uh, one-pointed types of concentration. And when you get into certain levels of uh, trance-like levels, you know you're in that trance, but there's no distractions at all. Now, what that says to me, what you're asking is that you've been doing not enough one smiling, not enough another thing using the six R's. You okay. still have some craving that's pushing things down and causing you to get in a trans light state. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I, I highly recommend that you start uh, using the six R's more. Okay. It'll, it'll become more clear to you then. Thank okay. you. Anybody else? Bhante, if there's no one else, may I go again? Yes, of course. So, Bhante, please correct me if I'm wrong. When I'm doing my meditation, then when thoughts come, so I realize, I recognize, and then, and being Chinese, what I see is, I, I see it as if I'm in the river, and the thought comes like a, like a corpse or a, one of the Chinese sea creature. A sea turtle. If it's right. very exciting thought, it's like a sea dragon. So right. I, I lift it, I look at it, and then I put it back down into the river, and it swims away. And as it swims away, I smile because I say to the thought, Meta to you. <laughs> and that makes me smile. And Zoom, the meditation goes on deeper to a quieter place. Correct me if I'm wrong with this uh, six R that. I think I'm so doing. You, you do better by not even recognizing what it is, just that it's a distraction, and then allow it to be relax, which is something you didn't say, and then smile. You don't need to say, may you be happy, and visualize a turtle floating away. Just allow it to be. As soon as you relax step, your mind becomes clear. There's no visualization in your mind at that time. Your mind becomes very bright and your mind becomes pure because you have let go of craving. Then smile and come back to your object of meditation. You're adding things into the meditation that's going to slow down your progress to so it's almost no progress at all. Thank you. Thank you. I have to practice six R more correctly then. Yes.
Fante, may I ask you a question? Uh, I was waiting for you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned today we are in the Buddha era. Yeah. And another quote I wrote down from you is, submerge yourself in the Dhamma and you will be a lot happier. Oh, yeah. So we have a family of five cats, a mother and four of her kids. And I wonder if playing your Dhamma talks out loud is something that will penetrate in their mind consciousness and help them in their... Yeah, of course. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. I had a dog. His name was Smiley. He was half pit bull <laughs> and half black lab. He started listening. He started uh, laying down at my feet when I started giving Dhamma talks, and he would listen the whole time. And there, we had a infestation of fleas, so we didn't want him in the house anymore. Mm -hmm. But when I started giving a Dhamma talk, he would stand outside the door and bark so much that you couldn't <laughs> hear the Dhamma talk. So we had to let him in. And he insisted to listen. I mean, he, he was really quite unique that way. And we had another dog that was a little bit smaller. We called her Silky because her, her, her fur was just like silk. It was really amazing. And she didn't care about the Dhamma talk so much, but she liked being around people that chanted. Mm -hmm. So if she she heard she was outside and she heard that there were chanting going on, she'd yell until she got back, got in the in the same room with them. She liked the chanting. So yeah, it can be a great advantage to those animals. And that will help them. So in the Buddhist uh, idea what I've read and heard several monks and nuns say is that having an animal form is not very conducive for their progress. And well, of course, their their mind works in a different way. They they go more on feeling than they do actual words. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard to get reborn out of the animal realm. Like cats, they, they like to go around, they kill mice and they kill other animals around and that killing keeps them in the animal realm. Yeah. But this dog that I was talking about, he had a sense of fun and he was really excited when he'd go outside, he'd start chasing the butterfly shadows. <laughs> and one day he jumped up and he grabbed a butterfly and he had this quizzical look on his face and then he opened up his mouth as the butterfly flew out. He, he wouldn't kill. He was very gentle that way. So when he died, he uh, was reborn in a, in a heavenly realm as a human being. Sometimes he would take on the form of a dog and then everybody would go around saying, what's this dog doing here? Why is he here? And then he'd ch change into the human form. But it's kind of unusual to see uh, an animal take that big a leap and be reborn in the Deva Loka. And the, thing, the reason that I, I see that happening was because he, he liked the, the Dhamma talk so much. Our cats too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll get in the comfortable. They, they look like they're, they might be sleeping, but they're not really. They're listening. And they like the feel of the Dhamma talks. And that, that calms their mind down. And your voice is quite soothing, so it helps. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. To me, my voice is very harsh. 
<laughs> that's that's because I'm listening to myself from the inside, not not on the outside. <laughs> Thank you, Bundy. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Shall we share merit? Yeah, in a minute. I would give people a chance. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Bundy. I, yeah. I hope you are well. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, I often hear that people say when someone goes to hire jhanas, they recommend recommend them reading the Our Tamsaka Sutra. Mm -hmm. What is your thought, or do you have any recommendation about that sutra and reading that? Well, there's a lot of suttas that you can read that are very good for that. My favorite is the Anupada Sutta, number 111 in the Majjhima Nikaya because that explains what each one of the jhanas is and the experiences you have while you're, you're in that jhana. What about the um, Avatamsaka Sutra? I'm not as familiar with that one. Okay. Yeah, most of the um, people that they talked was mainly from Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions, but I don't know how it well, is taken into Travada. I'm not Theravada, I'm Suttavada. Sure. Uh, the thing with Mahayana and Vajrayana is they have a tendency to change things from... Uh, the tranquil wisdom meditation to one-pointed kinds of concentration. And they don't have the letting go of craving in it. And that makes me uh, sus suspicious of that, that teaching. If it doesn't have letting go of craving in it, that means they're still bringing craving back to their object of meditation. And when they do that, that gets on a different path than the Buddha taught. Right. You know, they often uh, say that this is the first apparently sutra that uh, Buddha taught to his disciples, but apparently is above the understanding, so he's basically try to tune it down and dial it down and start basics, basically. But um, it explains all the realms of um, heaven, realm, and other realms, basically. But I don't know how appropriate it would be or what is well, the source of it. It's, it's it's hard to to judge, but when you are doing a practice. And this is the thing that got me absolutely convinced that this is the practice that I needed to be doing, was that I would read a sutta, then I would go off and practice. And if I had an experience that was pretty well described in that sutta, then I took that sutta to mean I'm on the right path. Right. Does that happen when you do that other sutta? Do you feel like you're on the right path when you do it? Or is it just that you hit a wall after a period of time and then you don't progress? That has never happened when I was doing this kind of meditation. I still go through progress right now when I'm doing the sitting meditation. I still have insights. I still have different uh, observations that are occurring. And this is right. after, what, 45 years of doing the meditation. Right. So, yeah, it, thank you. It, decide for yourself is basically what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. One other question, I guess, um, you were talking about explaining to people about 
election and other stuff. And I have something in my mind for the last couple of years about, I mean, I brought up a little bit about that to um, David, but recently this idea of engaged Buddhism is basically taking really on a stage and spreading mindfulness and is one thing sitting and do my meditation, of course, in my comfort zone and at home, but when interacting into uh, society and I guess how to engage in a way that is um, wholesome, but also spread mindfulness, kind of like Buddhism and activism rather than being passive and staying in my own comfort zone and meditation. Well, you naturally you naturally do that sort of thing when you're practicing twim. When you're using the six R's. You're going through personality development, and other people notice that you're acting in a more kind and gentle way, or you're acting in a more balanced way. Then they'll ask you about it. Just click on there. This idea of engaged. Uh, Buddhism, I, it's kind of gimmicky. I, I don't go along with right. it as much as uh, I do with the sutta, following the suttas themselves. But that's me. I, mean, I, I can't. If, if you're happy with what you're doing, and it leads to your having more happiness and clarity of mind, then continue on with it if you're satisfied with it. As I said, I'm not a teacher. I'm, I'm just a guide. And the guides, uh, their job is to make sure you're staying on the Eightfold Path. Right. Thank you so much, Bhante. Okay. Have okay. a beautiful week. Thanks. Yeah, you have a good week yourself. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You all have a fun week. Same Keep to you, happy. Bhante. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very well. Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.